Hello. Hello, we're starting now. Uh, we continue with uh, balance of grace, God's grace and law, and this is another important aspect. It is not hard to please God, although it is impossible to be perfect. Because many people think that it's too hard to please God. Because they, they say, you know, we can never be perfect. So they say, well, it's too hard, it's too hard. Obeying God is too hard. Uh, being a Christian, some people say, some Christians say, it's too hard. And some pastors say, uh, it's hard to be a pastor. And then also some pastors, I heard that they have a, a, a Sunday fear syndrome. That means they are afraid of Sunday because whenever Sunday comes, that means they have to preach and, and do, do different teachings and they, they, they feel pressure. Actually, you know, we can be relaxing, relaxed and enjoy our preaching instead of, you know, suffering. Okay, now Luke 15, 7. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. So what it says here is that, that um, if we have sinned when we repent, the whole heaven will rejoice. Now some people will say, well, this is just only for, for non-Christians to believe. But if a non-Christian, they believe and God, the whole heaven rejoices over him, then if a Christian who has been lazy and lukewarm, and then he now repents, will God be, you know, not show uh, much joy? Or will he show much joy because this person become a more precious person when he repents? So I hope that we all will repent and uh, uh, of our sins and say, God is very happy with me. So when we have sins and we know that when we repent, God is very happy. And then uh, in James 4, 8, Come near to me and he will come near to you. And John 15, 4, Remain in me and I also remain in you. This tells us that God will respond immediately. That when we come near to Him, He will come near to us. For sure He will be with us. And also it is Him who draw us to Him. It's Him, God, who draw us to come to God. In the first place, it's God attracting us to come to Him. And then, uh, remain in me as, as I also remain in you. So when we remain in Jesus and then He will remain in us, and in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches, he who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So when we abide in Jesus, then he will abide in us, and his life will show through our life. He will cause us to bear much fruit. He will change, in our, he will cause changes in our life. He will bring changes and bring fruits to our life. So I hope that we all have a close relationship with God, always trusting that God is happy with me and whenever I come to Him, God is happy with me whenever I love Him. He is very, very happy with me. So I'm, I'm full of joy uh, when I come to Him. You know, actually I encourage you to trust, to love God many times a day. You know, I love God all the time. I praise God all the time. I say, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. And also, always I believe in that God is happy with me whenever I come to Him. You know, when we come to Him sincerely, He's always happy. But some people say, well, I have sinned, so He's, he's not very happy with me. Well, then repent and then ask God to help us to overcome the sins. What is more important? To be pleased uh, that God is pleased with us or to stay in a, uh, you know, some people say to stay in the happiness of sin. Actually, sin doesn't bring happiness. It might bring a little fun, but then after that, there will be a lot of pain in our hearts. So I hope that we'll say, wow, I want to turn away from my sins and whenever I obey Him, He's very, very happy and He'll bless me. And then Mark 9.41. Now this explains Matthew 10 about giving a cup of water, a cup of cold water to a little one. So who is this little one? In Mark 9.41 explains that. 
For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, as surely I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. So if anyone give us a cup of water to drink in Jesus' name because we belong to Christ, so that means giving water to uh, someone who belongs to Christ, then we won't lose the reward. So this, this promise is for doing good to Christians. Now we also do good to the non-Christians to bring them to Jesus. And God would be very happy too if we you know, um, do good to the non-Christians to help them believe in Jesus. Even if they don't believe in Jesus, God is still very happy that we try to do good to people and, and try to bring them to Jesus. So here it tells us that it's not hard. You just give a cup of cold water. God is very happy with you. And then, so just now I just explained that it's not hard to please God. And then God is happy to bless us. God is happy to bless us when we love Him and obey Him. So He's very happy uh, whenever we obey Him. So we have the motivation to love Him and obey Him because He, he will always respond to us. First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.14 For the love of Christ compels us because we judge that thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So the, uh, the love of Christ compels us, motivates us to, to love him and obey him and to die for Jesus. Now to die for Jesus here means that, uh, that we put down our life, that we live for Jesus only. Because we just us that if one died for all, then all died. Then we have all died in Jesus, that we put down our sinful nature. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves. So we don't live for ourselves anymore, but for him who died for them and rose again. So we no longer live for ourselves, but we live for God, live for Jesus who died for us and rose again. So here it tells us the main motivation should be the love of Christ. It's not uh, the law, it's main motivation. Now the law does give us some motivation to turn away from sin, but it should not be the main motivation. <clears throat> Romans 8, 15. <clears throat> For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out about Abba Father. So that we receive the spirit of bondage, uh, not, not to receive the spirit of bondage, but receive the spirit of adoption. <clears throat> so we know that when we trust in God, we believe in God, we have the spirit of adoption that we cry Abba Father. Father, you are my Father. You love me. You care about me. So that's the biblical motivation that we, when we trust in Him, then we are adopted to be His children. Then we, you know, we can say, I can enjoy God. He has accepted me to be His child, that we belong to Him and we can cry to Him, Abba, Father, Father, I love you. I adore you. I trust in you. So our whole life can be full of joy because uh, we receive the spirit of adoption. And then how to be blessed by God. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. So um, that what God prepared for those who love Him are things that we can never imagine, the things that the eyes have not seen, the ears have not heard, and the mind has not thought of. So we say, thank you, Father. When we love you, you prepare for us that we never imagined. So we can always say, God give us all things. God give us all kinds of blessings when we trust in God. Now some people might say, well, I don't have as many blessings as you that I would say two things. First, look at what you have. That you have food, that you have Jesus' salvation, you have the joy of Jesus, 
count all those blessings. You know, I had times when I was in uh, difficult times also, but I count the blessings of God and just trust in God, continue trusting God, and then God's blessings come later. So we'll say, Lord, help us. Help us to look at the good things you have done for us so that we always count the blessings. And the second is, look at your life and examine your life. Do you have anger, frustration that affects your life? That uh, if God is not pleased with us, then it can bring destruction. And if we give the devil a foothold, he can come to, to steal from us. And Matthew 6, 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So when we seek God's kingdom, it has two meanings. One first meaning is we want more people to enter the kingdom of heaven. We want more people to be saved. And the second meaning of that is that we want God to be the king in my heart. Because where God is the king, there is His kingdom. You know, if a king has a kingdom, but the people don't listen to him, then it's not his kingdom. So when we listen to him and obey him, then his kingdom is in our heart. And then his kingdom is in our family, in our church, in the place where we go to. Wherever we go to, there is the kingdom of God. So we seek God's kingdom that more people enter the kingdom of God. And also wherever we go, there we live God's way and then God's kingdom will arrive at that place because God is the king there. We want to help people to follow Jesus and obey Jesus. And then all these things shall be added to you. And then all these things, all these good things uh, will be added to us when we seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Righteousness means His, his uh, commandment to His holiness, to obey Him. And then delight in God. And then God will bless us. Psalm 37, 4, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. Now, how to delight ourselves in God? I always count God's blessings. I think about God's creation. I always say, God, you're so good, so good, so good. I, I, I look at uh, our bodies. God created our body. God gave us wisdom. God gave us food. God gave us nature, God gave us rain and the sun and the soil and the seed so that we can have food. And, uh, and God gave us the Holy Spirit to move in our heart to have peace and joy and strength and uh, guidance from God. And God also prepared a way for us, of a way of eternity, a way of blessings for our future. And God prepared for us heaven also. So I say, I'll delight in God. I'm happy because of God. You know, all day long I say, God is so good. Hallelujah. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. So I always say, God is so good. And then when we delight ourselves in the Lord, then He will give us the desires of our heart that you know my desire is to bless more people and God is opening the way for me to bless more people I'm, I'm very happy to do that so I hope that you all will say yes Lord I delight in you all day long now even though you might have problems at home now first if you have problems with your wife or your husband first you want to be you know not to be affected by that and have the peace of God and the joy of the Lord and be patient with the person and uh, treat him with kindness and also listen to the person now I will talk about that more uh, perhaps tomorrow or day after tomorrow how to build up the relationship in the family so we want to treat people nicely to build up the family if we have problems in the family now if the person doesn't change then we want to learn to I trust in God I want to be nice to him but I don't depend on him very important when our spouse is not obeying God, we don't depend on Him. But we have to examine our lives. Is our attitude affecting the other person? Is our anger affecting the other person too? Are we responsible for their behavior? If we have sins, that we sin against our spouse and our family members, then there will be problems in the family. So we have to see our sins and then repent of our sins so that we can restore the family. Some people say, well, I have a problem in, a, in my family. There are a number of pastors say, my wife keep nagging me. 
uh, so how can I handle that? And I, my answer is, think about how you treat your wife. Does, do you treat your wife as Christ loves the church? That, that you love your wife so much that you're willing to give your life for your, your, for your wife? That you're kind to her and listen to her and be kind to her? I'm always kind to my wife. When I'm kind to my wife, then she's very happy and we enjoy life together and we serve God together. So I hope that we all will count all the blessings and if there is any problem, take care of that. And then we can always live in the joy of the Lord. And then Isaiah 58, 14, Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord and I will cause you to ride on the heights of the earth. So if we delight ourselves in the Lord and then He will cause us, cause us to be uh, to ride on the heights of the earth, then we'll go to a higher and higher place that we go to a higher, higher level, that God will be happy with us. So when we delight in God, it will bring all kinds of blessings. And Romans 8, 28, and he know that, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. So in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him. God will work in all things. All things means what? All things means conditions that are favorable and also unfavorable conditions. In all situations, God will work for the good of those who love Him. Now, it, not just for those who believe in Him. You notice the Bible always talks about those who love Him will be blessed by God. So, if we love Him, then all things will work for our good. Now, how does it work? It's like this. When things are good, then we praise God and have strength from God. Okay, And then things go well. And then we thank God for that. It works for, for, uh, uh, for our good. Now, But some people, in the good times, they forget about God. Then it doesn't work for the good because they don't love God. But if we love God, the good times will become blessings to us. And then how about the difficult times? In the difficult times, we trust in God more because we need His help and blessings. Then when we trust in God, then He will open the way for us. Then He'll open a way for us to, to bring, uh, you know, so that our life is changed. In difficult times, uh, let me share with you, I have had difficult times, but I keep trusting in God. Lord, I trust in you. You can help me overcome this problem. You can take away the problem. You can give me strength. And actually, I grow more in the difficult times. Actually, in the difficult times, I, I, uh, I have more, I acquire more wisdom how to handle problems, how to handle difficult people in my difficult times. And I learn to trust in God only, and God provides for me. And so I hope that all things will work for your good. So, so all, uh, for those who love Him, that, that God has promised us His blessings. And then God did not spare His own Son, but deliver Him up for us all. He will also give us all things. So the more we love Him, the more we trust in Him, the more we'll receive from Him, and your whole life will go higher and higher. And God has given me these four kinds of prayer to build a relationship with God. The first is prayer of grace. It's always saying what God does for us. Lord, You are loving me. You are blessing me. You are helping me. God is good. God is kind. So that's prayer of grace. Thank you, Lord. You're so wonderful. So I hope in our prayer, we always talk about God. You know, in my prayer, I, when I hear someone praying and always say, God, you're so wonderful. I praise you. I'm very happy because many people pray like this. Oh, I need this. I need money. I need a wife. I need children. I, need, I always need just looking at themselves. If they just look at their problems, they, they will not have much strength. But if we look at the goodness of God, God, you're so wonderful, so you're so good, then we have more strength. And then prayer of worship is from us to God. Thank you, Father, I love you. Father, I love you, I adore you. I appreciate you, I trust in you. And I also put in words that are more, uh, more, have more feeling, like, Lord, I lean on you. I rely on you. I enjoy you, I need you, I hold on to you, I like you. You know, 
I pray all the time. And sometimes my prayer is just, I like God. Without saying the words, it's just like God. It's like, it's like someone who is in love with another person. Even if he's not saying something, he's, he likes the other person even without words. So we can like God without words. Oh God, I just like you. When we think of God, we like Him. So I hope we we'll all learn to like God. That is delight in God. And an interactive prayer. Whenever we pray, we know that God is happy. So it's always saying, when I love you, I know that you're blessing me, you're with me, you respond to me, and you're very happy. Now that gives us a lot of joy. Now for myself, my joy comes a lot from this interactive prayer. For my whole day, it very often I would be praising God and loving God. God, you're so good. Thank you, Father. You're so wonderful. Hallelujah. And at the same time, my heart believed that God is happy with me now. God is blessing me now. God is blessing me now. God is blessing me now. God is with me now. I'm very happy with God. Hallelujah. And when I pray like this, God is very happy and I can enjoy God. It's always praising God and believing that He's happy with us. And, and that way I have a lot of joy. And a prayer of commitment. Lord, I dedicate my life to you. My life is for you. Please use my life. Please use my whole life. Now, I talk about grace, but I also talk about the law. We have the balance of God's grace and the law. God's grace is the main motivation, but we do have the law to rewind, remind us not to sin, to remind us of the consequences of sin. So there is a small motivation from the law. Now we obey the law, I obey the law, but the motivation should mainly come from God's grace, but it also comes from the law to remind us not to sin. So we should have this warning in our heart not to sin because sin is destructive. So we should be aware of the destructiveness of sins and overcome all sins with God's help. Now first, now here I, I name nature and grace. It's God's nature and God's grace. Now in the preaching method I have is called God's nature preaching method that we talk about God's nature and we talk about His grace. Uh, his nature is His inner quality. His inner quality. His grace is what He does to bless us. So here you see nature. That is His inner quality. God is holy. His holiness is beautiful. So God's nature is that He's holy and His holiness is beautiful. And in heaven, there's no more sin, and it is beautiful there. Heaven is beautiful. Why? Because it's full of love, and there is no sin. It's holy there. Revelation 21, 4, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So in heaven, God will wipe away all the tear. No more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. It's all, uh, no more pain. It's all love and joy. And Revelation 22, 3, there shall be no more curse. So in heaven, it's no more pain, no more yelling, no more fighting, no more gossip. That's why it's beautiful. So is your family like that? Is your church like that? So I hope you've tried to build your home and your church to be full of the love of God and His holiness. So holiness is beautiful. You know, I talk about God's motivation mainly from God's grace. Uh, secondly, from the law. You know, that but at the same time I would say God's holiness is beautiful. I pursue holiness. But the motivation is from God's grace. I pursue His holiness. I want to live in holiness. I want to obey. But my motivation is that I know that God is happy with me when I obey Him. God is happy with me. So, so it's always, you know, God's grace, God's blessings motivating me to obey Him. So, um, I obey God. I pursue holiness, not pressure by the law, not pressure saying I have to obey, I have to obey. But 
to say, God is happy with me whenever I obey Him. I'm happy to obey Him. And so, holiness is beautiful. And we want our home to be full of goodness and holiness. It's always love and always patience and kindness. No yelling, no fighting. And we want that to, for our church to be a, that full of love in our church also. And then this is warning. God searches our minds and hearts. Okay, so this belongs to the law. This is the law. All the churches shall know that I am He who searches the minds and hearts. Revelation 2.23 He searches our mind and our hearts. He examines our hearts and our minds. He knows what is inside us. So if we sincerely obey Him, He's very, very happy. He is very, very happy. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So we all have to appear in front of the judgment seat of Christ, and each one will receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So we all have to appear in front of God. Everything we do, whether good or bad, that will be, will receive, uh, and each one will receive the things that are done in the body according to what we have done. So if we have done good, then we'll receive good things. If we've done bad, then all these things will be in vain, will be, will go away. You know, it's in, like in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, about that there is the people's works, some are gold and silver and precious stones. Those will stay, but some people are, are stubble and hay, and all those will go away. So some people's life, a lot of it, will go away. I hope that we all will follow God faithfully and love God and God is very happy and it will stay forever. And then promise for those who pursue holiness, they will become vessels for honor. 2 Timothy 2.20 But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So, in a house there are precious vessels of gold and silver. And also there are uh, vessels of uh, not so honorable, uh, uh, sometimes vessel of dishonor, that wood and clay, uh, or the toilet. Okay, so we have these precious vessels and not so precious vessels. But if we cleanse ourselves, therefore if anyone cleanses himself, if we cleanse ourselves from sins and obey Him and live in holiness and love and motivated by God's grace, then we are sanctified and useful for the Master prepared for every good work. So that's a motivation, a promise of grace. When you obey Him, when you live in holiness, then you turn away from sins, then you live in, you know, your life will become, you become an a, a honorable vessel and you are prepared for every good work. So that's a promise when we obey Him. So that's a motivation to obey Him. When we know that, when we obey Him, then our life becomes very precious and we become precious. precious. Matthew 5, 19. Now, this is promise. Those who obey God will be great in God's kingdom. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So it says here, if we obey God's commandment and tell people to obey God, God's commandment, then we'll be great in the kingdom of heaven. So it's blessed for those who obey Him. So we do have this uh, motivation to obey God. And this is a promise from grace. It's a grace to motivate us to obey. That when we obey, then we become great in the kingdom of God. So that's a promise to motivate us to obey Him. Now this is a warning now. So. Warning is motivation by the law. 
promise is motivation by grace. The Bible does have both. In John 5, 14, see you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. So the, the man healed of 38 years of sickness that Jesus said to him, you're well again. Uh, stop sinning, lest the worst thing will happen to you. So, so, uh, so Jesus told him, stop sinning, because if you don't stop sinning, something worse will happen to you. Now, some people think that if we just repent and ask God to forgive us, then everything's over. That's not true. If we yell at someone and we ask God to forgive us, God will forgive us. But we yell at someone, it can hurt our relationship. It can hurt our reputation. It can hurt our life. So we must realize that sins are destructive. And then this is another warning. Sins will give the devil a foothold and he will come to steal, kill, and destroy. Ephesians 4.26 In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. So the context tells us that he's talking about sin. Paul was talking about sin. Do not sin. And don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. So, so um, turn away from anger. And do not give the devil a foothold. That means when we sin and we live in anger and have sin, then we give the devil a foothold. And then John 10.10, 10, the thief will come to steal, kill, and destroy. He will come to destroy. Jesus comes to give us life and life abundantly. Now what would Satan steal? Many people have many things stolen from them and they didn't realize that. I have Christians come to me for help. They have no joy, no strength, the family is broken, they, ha they don't have good relationship with people, they don't have good ministry, everything they do is in failure, uh, they are unhappy for the whole life and they complain to God a lot. So their life is full of pain and suffering and unhappiness. So they're not being blessed by God. They're not being blessed. It's stealing. Always Satan come to steal. What, what did Satan steal from them? Steal the peace. Satan steal the peace and joy from them. No more peace, no more joy. Now, how about fun? Now, some people think, well, if I go dance and drink, I have more fun and have sex with women, I have more fun. Actually, it will bring more pain and yelling and fighting because when you have sex uh, before marriage, you can ruin your own marriage or you can ruin someone's life and, you know, cause someone to be pregnant and a lot of pain after that. So they can have a short moment of fun, but after that is pain. But when we live in God's obedience, you know, when we obey Him and love Him and serve Him and enjoy Him, we can have fun. I have fun when I pray. You know, I have fun when I, pr when I pray, hallelujah, and I'm full of happiness. And I have fun with people. I have fun with my wife. I have fun with my church members. When I talk with them, I'm always happy. I'm always happy, and they're happy to talk with me. When I go to the mission field, people are happy to talk, to talk with me. They don't feel pressure. They feel motivated to, to obey God. So I enjoy preaching. And also, stay, Satan will steal their faith. They have no more faith in God. They say that God is not helping me and they have not much strength and they don't have not much wisdom. Because when people are angry, when they are in sin, they don't have wis wisdom. They, they're always yelling and fighting with people. And they also run out of resources. They, they, they cannot keep their job and they lose money. And their health is also affected. That, the, uh, that emotions affect their health. And the reputation, people don't like them, they don't have a good reputation, and they lose the trust of people. People don't trust them anymore. And they don't have good personal relationship, and they lose their loving family. The family doesn't have love. Actually, I have heard that many Christians and even pastors in the family is always yelling and nagging because they don't listen to the wife. And the wife is impatient and unhappy, and so the wife keep yelling at the husband and the husband keep getting angry. So it's both sides keep fighting. Now I will talk about how to build up a marriage in, uh, in the future, but uh, uh, you know, maybe tomorrow or day after tomorrow, that we want to keep this family 
to be in in full of love you know my relationship with my wife is always happy and she enjoys it and I enjoy it we enjoy every moment to be together I always do things to please her I always do things to make her happy so that is a loving family I you know that we want to keep that and also they lose opportunity they lose the opportunity to go higher and higher in their life to bless people more and to do more things for God or have a better job and then also uh, Satan will steal the ministry and it's steal the fruit of the ministry the result of the ministry and also steal God's plan and steal the reward and the worst scenario is stealing eternal life if a person lives in sin he can lose his eternal life if a person lives in sin and doesn't repent he can lose eternal life so that's terrible that is very very bad okay now here I give an example of fornication or adultery some people say wow it's having fun with women okay three points here first when we have fornication or adultery it causes God to be angry that uh, the person will lose the favor of God and will give the devil a foothold and the devil will come to steal kill and destroy every part of his life many people have having fornication or adultery they the whole life is broken down and second many men think that having sex with a woman is gaining something you know many men think that wow if I have sex with the woman and then just go away wow it's is uh, a pleasure uh, it's fun but actually they lose many things they lose the favor of God they lose a clear conscience they lose the spiritual strength and the most wonderful plan of God that God will not give him a wonderful plan and then they will lose a perfect marriage and the trust of other people so they don't gain something but when they are faithful in the family and they love the wife but they say my wife is not lovely how we treat our wife will make our life lovely or not lovely if we you know love them care for them and listen to them and have good communication with them then the marriage will be built up so men don't just say tell their wife obey me submit to me only we need to love them we care about them and listen to them and then they will they will love us and submit to us more and actually in Ephesians 5.22 talk about the wife submit to the husband but in the verse before that 5.21 it says that submit one to, uh, to another so submit to one another uh, when we submit to one another then we are blessed the husband should also submit to the wife and listen to her needs and her concerns and then the third point when a woman gets pregnant before marriage her date might leave her she might become a single mother and it will lead to serious problems so now for a man it will he will lose the favor of God and he can have all kind of problems and then for a woman to have sex before marriage you know he can get pregnant and then the person the man will go away and then he will have a lot of pain and he will have problem with the relationship with God and so it's suffering so I hope we all understand it's suffering but it happens that in many dating relationship the man always think of has, having sex with the woman always want to have sex and a woman is willing to give sex in order to get love but it doesn't work like that they think that if I give him the body and have sex with him then he will love me. It. It, it doesn't mean that when a man want to have sex with the woman after that he might lose interest and then he will see other women I want to go to have sex with more women so women stop thinking that uh, that you can get love by giving sex don't think that way follow God that is the best way for our life and then warning God hates sins and punish sinners 1 Corinthians 10 8 nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did and in one day 23,000 fell nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents so now here it talks about the Old Testament time but Paul here talk about you know this is a warning to us 
a warning to us don't sin because it can cause so many people die it can also bring destruction to us and also uh, in some si situation God can still kill people who Christians who uh, you know who don't obey God or non-Christians sometimes non-Christians are punished for their sins even actually sometimes just because of the sins they fall into different kinds of problem like there is a famous actor called James Dean he had this movie called a uh, rebel without a cause without a reason to be a rebel and he's always out of control he drove very fast on the freeway very very fast and he was caught by the police twice on that day but then the third time he was hit by a car and he died instantly so you know he thought he would you know he is a famous actor he got a lot of money he just doesn't care about the tickets but then he lost his life and then Acts 5 3 that Ananias and Sapphira they cheated God by you know selling the house because there are many there were many Christians who sold the house and give the money to the church and here they sold the house and then kept part of money and give the rest to the church now they can say this is part of money it's fine but they didn't say that they want to to look good so they say this is all the money and then Peter said you know why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price now you have not lied to men but lied to God so they they both died and also, this is another warning. Sowing to the flesh will reap destruction. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap destruction. But he who sows to the Spirit will reap everlasting life. And then the carnal mind is an enemy of God. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. And it's not subject to the law of God and nor indeed can be. So, And breaking one law breaks the whole law. For whoever keeps the whole law yet and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Now, why is that so? Because when a person sins, for instance, when he's angry with someone, the anger will ruin his peace, his relationship with God, and ruin his relationship with people, and ruin his relationship with God. So, ruin his relationship with God, people, and themselves. So every sin, lust will destroy relationship with people. People don't trust him anymore, and 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 affect the relationship with God. So it any any sin will destroy our whole life. And we are called to pursue perfection, First Timothy six fourteen, to keep this commandment without spot or blame, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. To keep the command without spot or blame. Now we're not totally perfect we still have sinful thoughts but the point is the more we have a close relationship with God the less sinful thoughts will come and then the sooner we take care of the sinful thoughts then the sinful thoughts will not come back uh, uh, we can take care of them uh, instantly in a few seconds so we're still not perfect because we still have sinful thoughts and when we obey God, we're still not perfect. For instance, sometimes when we help people, we might be impatient. That is a sin also. Sometimes when we pray, we don't have faith. That is also sin. Whatever is not perfect is sin. Whatever is not our faith is sin. Whenever we don't obey the commandment to love God with all our hearts and love people as ourselves, that's also sin. So we do have sin. and uh, But we... God is asking us to take care of our sins as soon as we notice that. And then God is very happy with us. Okay, and then we'll keep that, uh, how to overcome sin to the next session. So, a balance of God's grace. I live under God's grace. God is happy with me when I trust in Him, when I love Him, and I o obey Him, when I serve Him. He's very happy and He'll bless me. That gives me the main motivation. At the same time, I realize that sins are destructive. That is, uh, should be the secondary motivation. If I sin, it can bring destruction that Satan, Satan will come to steal, kill, and destroy, and my whole life can be ruined. I cannot enter God's plan, and God is not pleased with me, and then I can lose everything. And uh, so that motivation to tell us not to sin. So 
that motivation by the law should not be the main motivation because if it's the main motivation, then the person is always saying, oh, I'm not perfect. I, I'm not doing well enough. It's always under pressure. We don't have to live under pressure. So I hope that we'll all live, you know, with joy and peace and strength and, and enjoy God. At the same time, we understand that sin is destructive. So we want to take care of our sins and turn away from our sins, okay? So we, when we live under grace, doesn't mean that we follow the grace gospel. Grace gospel, just talk about grace without, without talking about the law. Like for instance, uh, uh, there's a ministry called Father's Heart. It just talks about uh, God's grace and uh, doesn't talk about uh, repentance or obedience much. Uh, it just talks about God's grace, you know, just believe in God's grace. And, and, you know, I was disappointed in that, that, that they just talk about God's grace without talking about God's law because God's law is also perfect. It's also from God. It's also good. Okay, let's close to the prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we praise you because you motivate us with your grace. Your grace is wonderful. You're full of grace. You're full of, you have many promises for us who obey you. Father, we trust in you. We love you. We obey you. We serve you. We want to follow you all the days of our life. Father, it's so wonderful to have you. We need you. We hold on to you. And we, our motivation is mainly from God's grace. We are compelled by grace. But at the same time, we have a reminder from the law. We know that sins are destructive and sin can cause us to stumble and also let Satan come to steal, kill, and destroy. So we don't want to live in sin. We know that any sin is destructive. Any anger is destructive. Any unforgiveness is destructive. Any lust is destructive. So Father, help us to overcome our sins and be with us. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, God bless you. And the next session, we'll talk about how to overcome the sins.